I want to welcome you all here to Zion's Hope and for our Open Bible Studio electives. And I hope you're enjoying the sessions, the teachings, and the various uh, different people come up here and the points of view and the way they teach are all different, but sometimes that's good. So tonight we're going to be taking a look at probably a very familiar passage to most of you. It's going to be in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. And I'll give you a moment to turn there. It's a pretty, I think it's a pretty impressive passage. And um, I really want us to look at this passage in a what if I was in Isaiah's shoes point of view. Or sandals. Or bare feet. I don't know what he was wearing. But just take that kind of view as we look at it. Because the God who showed himself to Isaiah is still the God who is God of this world today. And that's important to us. Let's come and pray, please. Come with bowed heads and bowed hearts before you, Lord, this evening. And we just want to worship you, adore you, lift you up, give you the glory. Lord, help us to understand who you are even more. Help us gain a deeper and more worshipful attitude about who the God of this universe is, that it may impact it, impact our lives like it impacted Isaiah's. Let us hear your words, and let us hear from the God of the universe, in whose holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Like I said, this is, a, this is a pretty impactful passage. It's familiar to everybody. Anybody read this passage before? Yeah, very familiar. <laughs> but I think it's one of, one of the more incredible images of God that the Bible records. You know, maybe even Revelation has a similar scene where God really displays himself in his glory. So I do want you to put yourselves in Isaiah's shoes tonight and kind of gain and sense the very awe of God and let the Holy Spirit work and bring you to that place that you're actually in the throne room with Isaiah. This vision that Isaiah has didn't come in a vacuum. In other words, there's a context and a background to why God called Isaiah and talked to him and showed him this vision. It wasn't just to show off who God was. It was actually communicate a point. And there's several points that I want you to pick up as we move along. So this is an intentional message by God to the prophet Isaiah. A little background in the life in Judah. Isaiah is a prophet in Judah and spent most of his time in Jerusalem. And he spent some time under King Uzziah. Now King Uzziah was a pretty good king. He did what was right most of the time before the Lord. But he also was a very powerful leader. He had a great military, some 350,000 well-trained, so they kept peace in the country. The nation really knew very little about any kind of wars around that area. God had blessed the nation at that time enormously. They were building projects and they were building houses. The economy was just going on all cylinders. Life was really, really good. But something was happening to the people of that country. Their hearts were beginning to turn. They were moving away from God over time. Isaiah gives us a pretty good view of that in the first few chapters. But the hearts of the people were beginning to move away from God. And they would turn from God and chase after ungodly pursuits. They would still worship God. However, other things of life would come and take up a higher place. Things like wealth material goods and possessions, the pleasures that this world has to offer, partying, and he even mentions drinking, things like power and 
they soon got an attitude of pride. All of that would build up and overcome them. But that was all under Uzziah. Life is good. And we can all relate in some way to that even in our own world today. But there was a coming turmoil that was about to hit the tribe or the kingdom of Judah because of their attitude towards God and in particular their king that was to come, Ahaz. Uzziah reigned 52 years. <coughs> but now the turmoil would begin. God would begin to withdraw his blessings away from his country and the nation would continue to rebel against him. As Uzziah dies, 52 years, that's a long time to have one king. They were quite comfortable with that king. So now we've got a great period of uncertainty. Who's going to rule? Well, it went down to the sun. Oh, we know King Ahaz. He's not like his dad. The Bible says he didn't do right under the Lord. And he would lead the country down a path of even further rebellion against God. So the country was in for a pretty rough road as the wicked son of Uzziah Ahaz would take control of the throne. He would have a rebellious attitude himself. He wouldn't even trust the God of the Bible. And he would lead the nation into hardening their hearts towards the Lord. God would start to move nation against nation. We see it beginning with Assyria. Assyria is a big empire up north of, I, of, uh, Israel, of Judah. And they would begin to make a move. So instability in the Middle East would become a problem. Peace would start to become elusive to that country. Nation would rebel against nation. And they'd also have the Philistines who are over onto their west. They would make a move against Judah. Edom on the eastern side would make a move against Judah. Even Israel to the north, the tribe of Israel, the northern tribe, would, would uh, get together with Syria and make an attack. So they're under attack. After many years of peace and a mighty army, things are starting to change. And their world, more or less, is starting to fall apart. You ever get to that point in life? where life begins to come crashing down upon you. It could be a lot of reasons. It could be family issues. It could be medical issues, financial. I mean, this is how we can relate to such a passage when we see life just falling apart. So I lay this question before you. As spiritual counselor to the kings and nation, what does Isaiah need the most? What does he need the most? And that's what God's going to bring. And like us, what do we need the most when things are falling apart? This passage is so great for that. If you're all going through a struggle in life, and if you're not, you will. Just come over here and read what the Lord showed Isaiah. Into this scene, into this time in history for Isaiah, when things are about to get rough, God shows who he is to this prophet. He shows his holiness, his majesty, and his sovereignty. Let's go along and read the first four verses, please. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim, each one had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. You have that picture? Can you imagine being there in Isaiah's place and God is showing this to you? I'd be wanting to run the other way if I could. God Almighty.
coming to him like this. It starts off with, I saw the Lord. That's written in an emphatic voice in Hebrew. It means emphasis, like exclamation points put to this. It's almost like Isaiah can't believe it. I saw the Lord. And the impact that that had upon him and what it meant to him. I mean, this is an incredible statement. It's also terrifying to see the Lord God Almighty in this place for him. But God is showing Isaiah who he is. And he's giving a proper perspective before he goes out and has to preach to the people in, of that nation. And he shows various things. There's no picture of God here. He didn't describe God as anything, did he? But he describes and states that there are various articles that he can see in the throne room, in the temple. God shows Isaiah these things to display some characteristics about God. And so as Isaiah writes them, let's look at what they are. The first one, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. That's easy, we know what a throne is. It's a place where one rules, where one has power, when one has majesty and kingship over things. What God is showing Isaiah is, yeah, King Uzziah died and he was a good king, but you know Isaiah, he's only a human king. I am Lord over all creation. What a one to put your trust in. What a foundation to have for any life, any ministry that you're about to go into. He is sitting there on the throne ruling. The second thing I want you to see is the train of his robe filled the temple. I think a better word for train is hem. Because on the priestly garments, they would have a hem around the robe, not really a train. We don't, it's not like it's a wedding dress where the train falls behind. It's more of the, the hem around the robe. But it's not the hem I want you to see. I want you to see that it fills the temple. It fills the temple. What's God communicating to Isaiah by that? His greatness. How big he is. It takes a big God to have a hem of a garment fill the entire temple. He's not some little God up in heaven. He is a big God that he fills the place. In other words, a big God can do big things. Exactly. If we have a small and weak view of God, then we have a small expectation from the God on the throne. We need to realize that he fills that throne. Any request, any time we come to him, he is way bigger than that problem, no matter what it is. He fills that place. Another thing we see is that it's a temple. It filled the temple. Temple is a place of worship, a place to be held up, lifted up, praised, praised upon, given the glory to. God is in the center of all of that, so He is due our worship. He is to be at the center of our worship. Another thing we see in this passage is He is high and He is lifted up. It's it mean He's high and lifted up? I get a picture, now put yourself in Isaiah's shoes. He's there, and I'll give you a hint, he's standing in the doorway. Because he can't get in. The, the hem of the garment is just filling the whole place. But he sees the Lord high and lifted up. Maybe strains his head back a little bit to see. Why, why is God doing that? Why not just have him down so I don't get a neck cramp or something? <laughs> he wants Isaiah to realize that he is way above anything else. Nothing else is his equal. That was a big problem in Judah. They had God coming down to their level. They were bringing other things up to the level of God. What God is saying in this passage is, no, I am much, much bigger than that. I am much higher than that. And he's given Isaiah a picture of that. God is to be lifted up in our lives in all things. Go back a couple of pages just to Isaiah chapter 2. Just chapter 2. And I want you to look at verse 7. Verse 7. 
you can see some of the things that the nation of Judah had lifted up and had counted more worthy than God. Their land is full of silver and gold, money. Wealth was worth more than God, lifted up. There was no end to their treasures. Their land is also full of horses. Power was more than God. No end to their chariots. Their land is full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. People bow down and each man humbles himself. Therefore do not forgive them. Look at verse 11. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled. The haughtiness of men shall be bowed down. Here's the important part. And the Lord alone, underline that word, alone shall be exalted in that day. In case you missed it and you read over that real fast, go down to verse 17. Look at how that verse ends. Oh, it's the same. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. Do you think that's important to God? How many things do we exalt higher and above God in our own lives? I know the quick answer is nothing. I like to look at your checkbook and be able to look at that and see where the importance is or the amount of time you spend with the Lord. I mean, there's a lot of ways to tell if he's exalted above all things. But that's what God is showing Isaiah back in chapter 6. So the message alone, God alone is to be exalted, is to be found in chapter 6. But I want you to look back in chapter 6. Go back up to verse 1. I saw the Lord. We noticed how impressive and incredible a statement that was, but I want you to see a word that's in there. And I want you to see his choice of words for God. Now look closely in your Bible and look at the word Lord. Do you see it? It's capital L, small o, small r, small d. The very first thing we're going to notice about that, it's not Yahweh, the covenantal name for God. That would be all caps, or Jehovah, some people say, L-O-R-D, caps. So this is not that. It's not El El Yon. That'd be great, most high, that would fit, but that's not the one he chose. He uses the word Adonai, and he picked that word on purpose. Because if you understand the definition of the word Adonai, it is the emphatic plural of the word Adon, which means master, king, lord of the whole earth which fits this scene perfectly. Just in the name, I saw the ruler of the earth. I saw the master of everything there up on the throne. It adds to his kingship. It adds to his control over all things. This image of God ruling over all things is going to help him with the chaos he's going to see in his own country. When he sees the invading armies of Assyria come down and start knocking off this nation, that nation, and the kings start to worry, and Ahaz, he does his thing. He doesn't trust the Lord. But then we got Hezekiah, and, and he's surrounded with Sennacherib outside, you know. Where are you, Lord? But Isaiah has this burned in his mind. I saw him. Hezekiah, I saw him. He, he will take care of us. He is king. And, and for us, what a comfort that brings to anything. Amen. Bring it on. Because my Lord, he's on that throne and he's ruling still. He's controlling the affairs not only of my life, but this world. So I got nothing to worry about. I want you to look at verse 2. Above it, what's it? The robe. Not above God, because God alone is to be exalted. But remember, his robe fills the entire temple. So above his robe are these, I guess I'll call them creatures, but what they are are angels. But above it stood seraphim. These seraphim are very interesting, and I could go on and on about what they are, <clears throat> but they are angelic beings. Only Isaiah uses the term seraphim to describe angelic beings, so I got no place to go to get another definition. This is it, and he's not giving me a whole lot. 
So we're going to have to be careful what we say about them. Ezekiel says he saw cherubim, different. He describes them differently. John, in Revelation, he just he didn't put a title like that on. He just called them living creatures. Are these all the same? I would say no. I would say what we're seeing through the eyes of the prophets is various orders of angelic beings that have various tasks that are to be done in heaven. I think there's a hierarchy of tasks that are done. But these, if we go outside of Isaiah, or actually outside of this, this passage, you know what they're called? Fiery serpents. I don't think fiery serpents will be flying around God's throne. But there's another definition for these creatures, and that's burning ones. So you're starting to get an idea what they may look like. What's Isaiah seeing? He must be seeing something with a flame or hot. I can't tell you what else. He doesn't give us much to go on. But they're called, many places, burning ones. That would be scary to see them hovering above God in his or his robe in his, in his throne. He does give us some information about their wings. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face. Okay, why did he cover his face? He's in the presence of the holy and glorious God. He's a created creature also, and he is that close to God Almighty. They hide their faces. And then it says, with two, he covered his feet. I believe that's a position or an act of humility. I mean, I can only think of Moses. Remember Moses in Exodus chapter 3, verse 5? What did God do? He said, Moses, take off your sandals. You're on holy ground. Something about the feet. That God says, cover them, take off the shoes. This is a holy place. So there's some humility there also. And then with two, they flew or they hovered. Look at verse 3. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of of his glory. I want you to memorize that top line. Kadoish, Kadoish, Kadoish Adonai Sabayoth. The T is silent. How you got it? You know, you're, not, you're going to have to know Hebrew when you go to heaven. I mean, that, God's not going to speak English. You're going to have to be able to do this. But um, it's called a trisagion. That's pretty fancy stuff. It just means trisagion. It's Greek. Just means three times holy, not very fancy. Or emphatic Semitic triplet. That's a you got some good technical stuff to bring back to your church. Hey, do you hear the emphatic triplet? <laughs> they say what? But Isaiah is telling us what the seraphim are saying, and look what it says. They're crying to one another. Now a lot of people get the impression that it's in unison, but if you look closely, it's one to the other back and forth. I was going to split you in two and we'd have a little practice session, but I said, no, nah, I don't have enough time. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, holy, back and forth they go. Can you get the picture as it's going back and forth, lifting up God in this way, emphasizing this characteristic of God. We emphasized his sovereignty, his kingship, his majesty. Now his holiness is being shouted out by these burning ones who are just lifting God up in an incredible scene. This word, kadosh, holy, the primary meaning of that word is separate, set apart, unordinary, not ordinary, and leads us to 100% pure. He is pure everything that's good. He is pure love. He is pure justice. He is pure mercy. He is pure everything. This triplet emphasizes that characteristic of who 
<coughs> of who God is. It's like putting three exclamation points on the end of a, an end of a sentence, just to emphasize what's going on. You know, these words, kadosh, 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 they, they had an impact on Isaiah that we can't fathom. We sit in this room and we try to figure out, you know, what did Isaiah think? But if you read the book of Isaiah, and it's, I know it's long, it's 66 chapters long. It's a good book to read, sometimes, sometimes hard, but it had a tremendous impact on his life, this scene, this quality. I mean, do you know that he used the word holy 51 times in his writings? Do you think he didn't get the message? He heard it, and he communicated that on to us. You know, he writes holy, only second, the only other book that comes more is Leviticus. 77 times where it's emphasizing the separateness of God, separateness of the nation, the unmixing with other nations in all of their sacrificial ways. All of those laws and everything were given to demonstrate holiness, to be separate from the world. Separate from the world. I wonder how the church is doing with that nowadays. If we define holiness as unmixed and unseparate, I think we're failing. But that's my opinion. But another word that Isaiah derives out of this scene, he calls God the Holy One. This is almost a trademark of Isaiah because we see the word the Holy One, that phrase, only 40 times in the entire Bible. He uses it 27 of those 40 times. Again, do you think he got the impression of holiness about God? Over and over again, he says the holiness of God, the Holy One. <clears throat> it's interesting we see a similar scene with John in the book of Revelation chapter 4 we go there and we see this the four living creatures each having six wings were full of eyes around and within they do not rest day or night saying a similar passage holy 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 now this is not Hebrew Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come so we see the trisagion right there but then he attaches Lord God Almighty instead of Lord God of hosts. <clears throat> the interesting word I'd like to pick out in this is Almighty. It is Pantocrator. Pantocrator. If we understand what that Greek word means, it means that he is the controller of all things. Are you hearing a very similar message to two different prophets one in the Old Testament one in the New Testament to John they're both getting the same grounding in who God is and they're both getting the same message he is holy he's in charge he's holy and he's in charge Isaiah was about to bring a message of doom the nation was going to go through a period of exile and destruction he was going to need to know that God is holy and that God is in charge no matter what happens John is going to get a message, we call it revelation, a revealing of judgments, of trumpets and bowls and seals, and he's going to see the world destroyed. He's going to need a grounding. God is holy. God is in charge. No matter what happens, he's in charge. He is a holy king. Look back, if you will, on chapter 6, verse 4. Remember, here's John in the doorway, probably, can't get in. Still going back and forth, hearing holy, holy, holy. He sees the vision of God and the seraphim there with the burning ones. He's getting quite a show, but then in verse 4, And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. We get two more things happening here. As he stands in that doorway, he watched, he heard, and guess what? Now he feels something's going on. He is getting an experience that he will never forget as that place is now shaking. God is giving him all the senses, the smoke, very likely from the incense, so he may smell something. They don't tell us that. But this is a whole body experience of who God is. Can now put yourself in Isaiah's sandals. I see, I hear, I feel, it's shaking. Now try to get a sense of where you would be. 
you would be in some sort of trembling mode, I'm sure, at that point in time. God is engaged. Visions of Mount Sinai would pop into your head probably. You remember what happened there and when God came down on that mountain? And thunder and lightning and smoke. And what did the people do? They were in fear. They backed away. They said, Moses, you go up the mountain, right? But God's mere presence, you remember that mountaintop shook like an earthquake? You know, when God's present, things tend to shake. When God's present, things tend to shake. He is an overwhelming God. Well, the psalmist wrote this, Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob. We're defining who God is and we're getting quite a picture, aren't we? He is an overwhelming presence and holy that the whole world will shake. Is that your God? Is that your God? Yeah. I look around at our world today, our country, the people, the churches. <clears throat> Sadly, at least in my opinion, I think most people have a smaller, very weak view of who God is. Why would you expect much from a weak God? I mean, look at the last few years. My generation is just as guilty. You have movies and books. <coughs> like in the shack. Where God is a woman named Papa. But that's all right. Before that, we had George Burns. Oh, God. See, I'm starting to hit our own generation. And then in between, we had a movie called Bruce Almighty with Morgan Freeman. Now, if you watch those movies, you can be forgiven. <laughs> but those movies are giving us a false view of who God is. None of those movies portrayed God as God. I think it's a work of Satan to demean and to bring God down. It makes God more like us. But isn't that what happened in Isaiah's day? I alone shall be exalted. We need to be careful what we do with this God. We all will tremble and everyone will tremble, especially as the day of the Lord comes. And it will come. And it will be too late for many. Look at verse 5. So I said... Remember, he's standing there in the doorway. And it's suddenly the, his attention is on himself. You know, his mouth, his jaw dropped, his mouth was hanging open, and he's watching this, and all of a sudden says, Uh-oh, I'm, I'm in trouble. What's going on? What about me? I'm in the doorway. No way out. Woe is me, for I am undone. He had seen the Lord. Exodus 33, 20 may have been flashing through his mind. He said, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. Can you imagine that? I saw the Lord. Uh-oh. You know what that means? I die. And there he is, sinful Isaiah, standing before the Lord in this scene. No man shall live. This is a cry. Again, we talked about this word last time. Oi. Alas, despair, cry, life is over. I saw the Lord. I'm going to die. I'm, you've got various translations. Undone, I'm ruined, um, all kinds of different translations. I'll disintegrate. He can't live, in other words, before the Lord. He's going to perish and life is over. Well, I looked at that passage. I said, you know, I lived in the woods of Maine. I mean, I lived in the woods of Maine. 11 acres in Maine. Nothing. I treed, I hauled in wood out of there, and I brought in 11 poles from the main drag, which was not really a main drag. We had a mosquito problem. Some of you from the north know what I'm going to say. You go down to the store and you buy yourself what I call the bug zapper. <laughs> right? Big light, you hang there on the garage, and all night long, zip, zip, zip. What's happening? They get attracted to the light and they get, uh-oh, too close. Gone. I thought of that when I saw Isaiah. I'm too close. <laughs> I'm back on earth, I was fine worshiping in a temple. I'm too close. 
I am going to get zapped. I got to believe God, even in this instance, veiled his glory just a little bit. I mean, if God was to unleash completely his glory and who he is, I think there would be a whirlwind. Nothing could live ever in that area. So I think he veiled it. I want to go to, and you don't have to turn there, but Zechariah chapter 14. It's about the coming of the Lord and the return of Christ on the Mount of Olives. I'm just going to read you a couple of verses. Just to put it in context, chapter 14 of Zechariah starts off, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming. It tells us exactly when this scene is happening. <coughs> Verse 4 says, And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, talking of Christ. So it's the return. It's his actual landing on planet Earth. It says in verse 6, It'll come to pass in that day there'll be no light. Verse 8, In that day there'll be living waters flowing from Jerusalem. Verse 9, The Lord shall be king over all the earth. So we know when this is happening. But there's an interesting verse that has always been puzzling to many people. And it's verse 12. And it's the one I picked for you right here. It's talking about God's judgment on the nations. And this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the people who fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets, and their tongue shall dissolve in their mouths. Isn't that wonderful? A lot of people say and want to say, well, this is proof. Nuclear war is going to end the world. Because that would be the result. However, I would like to submit to you... Could this be the mere presence of an unveiled God landing on planet Earth with such power and such presence that it's overwhelming his enemies to the point that they just evaporate before their eyes? I would say that's a better situation than the other. Who is Isaiah? Mere flesh standing in the doorway before God himself. As they repeat the words, he thinks, I don't even dare speak those words. I'm a sinful man with sinful lips. There's the seraphim, the burning one, standing before God. Holy, I wouldn't even be able to whisper those words without feeling guilty. My lips are so unclean before the Lord. I'm a grotesque sinner standing here in the presence of a holy God. This is starting to eat to the core and the depths of his very being when he's in the presence of the Lord God Almighty. Maybe down on earth, before the people, I was pretty good. Maybe they would even call me the holy prophet. Compare myself to man. That's easy to do, right? But standing there in front of this holy God in this place, I got a whole different perspective of who he is and who I am. And I know what I'm not. He is impure, defiled. He's unworthy to even live. All this going through his mind before the Holy One. The brightness of the light of the glory of God darkens the deepness of the darkness of the blackest night. The contrast is overwhelming to him. The finite pile of dust meets the infinite holy God. The finite pile of dust (coughs) meets the infinite holy God. Job, he called this one pretty good. Job 42, 7, Therefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. He knew who he was before the holy God. This is the very beginning of salvation, is understanding who God is and who you are. It's the very beginning of a ministry to a holy God. Understand who he is and who you are. It's the very beginning of a walk with the Lord, who he is, who I am. Anything you want to do on this planet, understand who you are, who are you not. And you're ready to start for God. Look at that passage. He declares his sinfulness. Woe is me, I am undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Why? Why? For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He doesn't plead for mercy. He doesn't plead for forgiveness. He doesn't recite the sinner's prayer. 
the Romans road. He doesn't offer repentance or seek any kind of forgiveness. He doesn't say anything to God to try and correct the situation. But God hears his heart. He has a broken heart before God. The psalmist wrote this, The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. That's what's going on in the heart of Isaiah in this passage. God knew what was going on. You don't have to do anything, Isaiah. I can see it. You understand the situation. You understand. Ah, oh, this man is getting ready for ministry. He's almost ready though, as he molds the Isaiah into the person he wants and to send him out into the world to meet the world. He understands who God is. He understands who he is. Now I'm getting close to using Isaiah to do my work. Verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me. I saw that and I said, wait a minute. Having in his hand a live coal. Now remember, these guys are holy, holy, holy. They stop, they pause for a minute, grab a live coal with tongs and I'm coming at you. I'd be like, oh no. I can't imagine anything so fearsome. But God knows the heart of what's going on in Isaiah. He initiates this action based on what's going on in his heart. And he knows what Isaiah needs. He sovereignly and unilaterally comes to Isaiah with the use of the seraphim to solve the problem. What a God. What a merciful God. But it all started with the broken heart. First the iniquity is taken away. Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, removed. Your sins purged. That word purged means to cover or atoned for. We see that word, oh, used an awful lot in Leviticus. Here I saw it and I just put down a few verses. Chapter 4, verse 20, verse 26, verse 31, verse 35, because they all ended the same way. So the priest shall make atonement, kafar, for them. Same word here. But look at the result of the atonement. And it shall be forgiven them. The result of that kafar is they will have forgiveness. What's going on with Isaiah right now is he's receiving the forgiveness of God by the covering of his sin. With the kafar of his sin. Verse 8. He's now ready. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord. This is the first time he spoke in the entire chapter. Eight verses in. And also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? I'll just highlight very quickly the word us. Because a lot of people say, Well, that's just the group of the angels being in the room. And I say, No. I think we see the same word back in uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Where it says, let's make man in our image like us. He uses the same and similar words. So I think this is a picture of the Trinity. God has a mission for the forgiving servant. Notice the progression here. He sees God. He sees himself. Now there's service to be made to this God. God says, I need somebody. That's all he says. Whom shall I send and who will go forth? It's interesting how God calls prophets and people into ministry. Think of Moses in the burning bush. And Moses pleading and arguing with God. And finally God gets a little bit angry and says, go. Then you move down to Ezekiel. Ezekiel's by the river Shabar. And he's there with his people and this heavens open up and God, he sees the throne of God and he passes out there and trembling and God picks him up and says, go. Paul, he knocks off the horse with a bright light. He says, blinds them, and he says, hey, go, go into Damascus, and you wait there for Ananias. John, he opens up the heavens, there's another door. Didn't take John much, just said, come here, boom, I'm there. <laughs> no such thing here, a little different with Isaiah. Just an offer of a job opportunity. God's like, takes his job opportunity, as want ad, nails it to the board, and says, help wanted. No description, not going to tell me what I'm going to do. How many people call up, say, I'm available. No, we're going to say, what are you going to do? Not here. He, he knows who he's serving. And he is answering the call. 
There's no coercion. There's no compelling him. There's no uh, guilt laid on him. Just, I need somebody who's there. I don't know how many people are there to respond, but he says, I'm here. Here am I. I'll go. One thing about serving the Lord is a high view of God translates into a high view of service. You value serving God if you know the God you serve. A weak and low view of God means he's not worthy of serving. I would encourage you to serve this holy God. Remember when I pastored the church, I had an elderly lady. I'll be careful here. But she was, like, she was like 92 with a walker. And I remember she got saved at that age. You know what the very first thing she said? What can I do? I have to do something for the Lord. I can't just do nothing. Now this lady can't walk. So we gave her a card ministry where she wrote out cards and sent them out to everybody in the church. But she was compelled like Isaiah here is. It's his reasonable service. I have to do something. I'm going to close and wrap up. We're not going to cover the rest of the chapter. But verses 9 through 13, Isaiah is giving his marching orders. And I don't know. I know he didn't have second second thoughts about the marching orders. But he was told to go out and talk to the people and preach. And they won't listen to you. And... It ain't going to happen. And, but a hard message, he said, how long? Oh, until they're destroyed. So uh, not the most pleasant of tacks, but he was faithful. He preached the word for many years until he eventually faded out of history, at least in Isaiah. But there's a little verse in Hebrews chapter 11, and I think I may have mentioned it once, in verse 37, where it talks about prophets in their service to God and what they went through for God and how much faith they had. And it mentions that one little phrase, they were sawn in two. And many people believe, and I think rightly so, that this is referring to at least Isaiah. Because the story goes that he was hiding in a tree from Manasseh, was chasing him down for the words he was preaching, tied the tree up and then sliced it in two. Now that's not in the Bible, that's in the Jewish writings, but I think it has some credibility. What a price to pay for a faithful man of God. But you know what? He had seen the Lord. He knew who he was serving, and it made all the difference. He gave his all for the Holy One who is his all. What's our view of God? What's our view of service? What are we doing for him? I hope tonight you've got a fresh image or maybe a different image of who he is. Feel encouraged if you're struggling, but at least understand who God is. Let me pray. Father God, we thank you for this image, this picture, this throne room, this who you are. We thank you for the writings that we can relate to. No matter what comes our way, we know what Isaiah went through. He was faithful to the end and even unto death. Lord, Put that heart in us that we would come to you with the same heart he had, faithful to the end, worshiping you, praising you, serving you, and doing your will here on planet Earth. And until we come again and meet you in the glory, to you go praise and honor forever. Amen. Go deeper in your understanding of God, His people, and His plan for planet Earth. Zion's Fire magazine is an exceptional resource with powerful insights from Scripture that provide a clear understanding of God's ultimate plan for the last days and the return of Jesus Christ. As a first-time subscriber, you'll receive a free one-year subscription to Zion's Fire magazine with no strings attached. Request your free subscription by visiting our website or by calling our toll-free number and we'll send you six free issues, one every other month, for a full year. We depend on the generosity of viewers like you to support the ongoing production of these programs. Your donation, whether large or small, is greatly appreciated. 
Donations may be given online at www.zionshope.org or by calling us toll-free at 1-888-781-9466. Stay informed and see the latest from Zion's Hope by liking us on Facebook, subscribing to our YouTube channel, and following us on Twitter.